In the previous video, we looked at how CRISPR came about and grew to become one of the most exciting scientific breakthroughs today. Science aside, what else can we learn from its discovery? Revisiting the early days of CRISPR's discovery, you will notice that neither Francisco Mojica nor Philip Horvath had set out to undertake groundbreaking research. They were merely going about doing routine tasks as part of their jobs or investigating something that caught their eye. Likewise, you may be hidden in a laboratory, unknown to the world, busying yourself on researching something few know or have heard of, with the odds of discovering the next breakthrough seemingly negligible. However, the truth is, breakthroughs are frequently the summation of countless small discoveries, and you might be working on that small but crucial discovery right now. Furthermore, you are certainly not in this journey alone. That cool manuscript that you write for journals, this important form of communication and knowledge sharing will ensure someone, somewhere in the scientific community, will pick it up and eventually build on it. Multiple discoveries about CRISPR were made by many scientists throughout the years. And the reason why CRISPR can grow so fast today is because each discovery was communicated to everyone effectively. Through journals and publications, the scientific community shares in one another's knowledge successes and failures, and science advances as a whole. While collective progression is an excellent way to accelerate scientific development, it does cause a unique problem too. In the discovery of CRISPR, it is exactly because so many scientists participated in CRISPR's development, with each having made significant contributions, it is impossible to pinpoint a particular person and declare he or she discovered CRISPR. That is the problem that has been unfolding in recent years, as scientists scramble to claim patent rights to CRISPR. Many scientists consider their work to be the significant milestone in CRISPR's discovery. But so many important discoveries were made based on previous discoveries, which were based on even earlier discoveries. Instead of a single scientist's discovery of CRISPR, the situation is more of a group of scientists' discovery of CRISPR. This makes it extremely difficult to conclude who should have the patent rights for CRISPR? Why should it matter to you, a layperson? Why, of course it should. We all eat food, medicine, and get treatments, which are products of biotechnology. Given CRISPR's immense potential for real-world applications, such as possibly rectifying mutations that cause cancer, and hence curing cancer without chemotherapy, whoever manages to claim rights to CRISPR will be able to control the direction of its development deployment, and access to public, who may one day depend on medicine or treatments enabled by CRISPR. Whether you will eventually pay $13.50 a pill for an essential drug, or $750 a pill, will depend on who is granted the patent. Look at the case of price increase of 5,000% for Daraprim in 2015, a drug patented and FDA-approved in 1953 and it becomes all too easy to see how patent grants on CRISPR in the 2020s now will affect you and your kids' medical treatments in the 2040s. This is what makes the result of this patent dispute so highly anticipated. However, for now, we can turn our focus to solving our own little puzzles while constantly keeping updated with our friends' work. Remember, we never know what our work may turn into.